I am going to cover it in five points today. So I'm going to talk about dollar differences, the owner administrative side of duties, insurance, government compliance, and the business sectors. So all of these are related to hiring subcontractors or you hire an employee. And then at the end, I want to talk about best practice, especially with COVID being the way it is and what is really your next move in terms of uh, getting an employee. So um, here, and uh, let's go through the dollar standpoint. And in terms of dollars, and I, I'm, I know that you, uh, you would agree with me. And when you hire an employee, and you already give them a monthly payment. You know that, okay, your salary is $2,000 a month, or you say that your hourly rate is $20 an hour. So whatever they work, you calculate that you come up with a gross salary. So this is where I want to introduce to you what I call the haircut rule. And what that means is when you offer a gross salary, consider, consider, that is some that is the person's height so let like, just like me i stand there i am 5.3 okay so i you, you you see my height you know that you know that's you that's you but what you did not realize it in accounting in terms of dollar amount you pay me is not 200 two thousand dollars is two thousand two hundred fifty so i call that 25 percent of haircut rule so you need to know that if i pull my hair up i am taller but that much taller is actually the 25 percent where um you need to pay as an employer okay you hire me for two thousand Back in your mind, you need to think of 2250 That's my real cost to you. Then you may ask me, well, Ying, tell me, where is the $250 come from? They come from several areas. Number one, there is about 8% is coming from your Social Security Medicare employer match. So remember, that's 8%. Then there is another 3 to 5%, let's just make it a 5%. So that would be coming from your state unemployment insurance side. And then you also have workers comp. Workers comp normally would ask you for three to 25%, depends on your profession. So we're just gonna say three. So we had 8% plus five uh, plus three. So we got 16 already. Then the other, the other 6%, which will make up the 25% total, it is what we call employee-related benefit. For example, and you may give your employee cell phones for so they can work, they can pick up the phone. So that's your overhead. And then you may have 401k, you may have health insurance. So all of these things related to employee that come into the cost. So I call that 25% hair cutting rules and you need to know and you have that 25% height you need to add. So my real height is not 5.3, my real height is actually higher, okay? So that is what employee would cost you. So I want you to understand the dollar difference. The subcontractors, you also agreed to pay the subcontractor for 2000. Do you have other costs? You don't and you just have that 2000 equals to 2000. So this is where from the dollar standpoint, it is very different, right? So now you ask me, oh Ying, I don't know whether I can hire an employee or not. Now, you know, business is going up a little bit. I just don't know whether I'm ready or not. Why don't you know? Because whatever you have left over and you feel like you have more jobs coming in, but you don't have people to do, you have a little profit, that profit, that profit is your gross salary of that employee. Or maybe, and you can classify that to be a subcontractor, obviously it saves your money because you don't have to pay that 25% on top of the pay, right? So it is always a tendency for a small business owner to think of hiring subcontractors 
than hiring employee. And I will cover that later in my other point because not is it is not something that you can do whatever you want or just based on the dollars. So the other the other aspect is number two of the five. It is administration from this standpoint. Why do I call that administration? Just because in your business, when you have employee or subcontractors, you need to manage them, right? So you that is a burden for you. For 1099 subcontractors, and you are paying by their jobs, not by their time. Okay, they finish a job, you pay for a job. So that's your administration. Maybe you are thinking, well, that's easy because, you know, I have them uh, putting in the windows. They put in the window, I write them a check. And I go over and look at the window quality and I know that's okay. So I pay them the, the fee, which is great. But if you have, if you get into an industry where when you pay them by job is not really relevant, for example, and you can't pay the chef in the kitchen, in the restaurant by jobs, okay? And so that is, by that industry, it is not allowed. They are employees. So subcontractor give you a way to administrate them by jobs, maybe simpler for what you're doing so you don't have to care about they didn't show up at eight o'clock in the morning. And, but for employees, it's different. You administrate them in a lot more details. You regulate the hours, quality of work, and you also have to do quarterly filing for your employee wages. Then you have the the annual filing is not 1089 anymore it's w2 w3 so and if your employee just had a lot of troubles outside of work then they have garnishment the lawyer might be calling see whether the employee is still working here they want to garnish more wages and the child support all kind of things related to your employee would come to you but the same thing doesn't happen with the subcontractor. So that's our second point of the five. Then our third point of the five is the insurances. Insurance related to people who work for you. If you are a employer, if you are a small business owner, and you actually would come across these insurance, workers comp, general liability, and insurance, uh, insurance, professional liability insurance. Like for community CPA, we have professional liability insurance. If one of our employee had done things wrong and we owe you $5 million, then our insurance company will step in, okay? But if it is my subcontractor who made a mistake, cost you $5 million, my professional liability insurance will not cover that subcontractor. So subcontractors should have their own liability insurance. So this is the big difference in terms of employee and subcontractor. But of course, unemployment insurance, as a small business owner, when you have employee, you pay for that. You go to pay to the workforce so your worker leave you or they uh, you let them go and they can qualify for unemployment benefit. And, but for subcontractors, you, you let them go, it doesn't happen, right? You don't pay unemployment. So unemployment insurance is only for employees, but workers' comp somehow is different. And in long time ago, when, I in, when, I was in the practice, when I'm in practice, and workers' comp never cover people who are not workers, who are not employees of the company. And with, um, with the, with the industry change, especially in the construction area, there are so many subcontractors and the accident and the people, you know, the people who you hire are confused whether they're your employee or your subcontractor. So you got into lawsuit because uh, they're not your employee. So you didn't buy workers comp, but they think they are. So you get into the sticky situation, right? So in this case, and the workers comp now, and especially for construction field, they require workers comp to be placed on whatever that person is, whether it's subcontractor or your employee, regardless, as long as the subcontractor don't have workers comp on his own, then you are responsible. So knowing that from the insurance standpoint, 
you know, obviously, if you have a subcontractor in the construction uh, company, you are the owner of the construction company, your subcontractor who doesn't have workers comp, you still have to cover them. So that particular area, you don't save any money. And what you probably saved is just general liability insurance. But I will advise you that if your subcontractor don't have any of these insurance, you should buy it for them or you need to require that so you don't end up end up in a hot situation where you have to pay for their misdeed even though they're not your employee right all right and this is my number four of the five i'm going to mention and we're going to stay on this slide a little longer i know because there's a lot of things related to this so when you have when you have a business and you have people paid as a 1099. You also have people paid W-2. And if IRS walk into your office, walk into your business, and IRS's job is to make sure that you are actually making everybody who's supposed to be employee, employee. So they will look at your subcontractors. For example, and we have a restaurant um, client who got audited by IRS. So IRS look at their payroll and um, you know look at their sales and they said, oh wow, John and you, 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 you two, you make a lot of sales, but without a lot of employee. How did you do it? You know the industry has a standard and the percentage of wages representing you know by looking at your sales, people with industrial with your industry sector knowledge would know that how much of a payroll you normally should run but you are off balance so the irs said we want to know why and either um either you show them that well you know we're just efficient because we're a fast food area we don't really have a lot of people need to weigh in and you know um standing to wait for client whatever reason you find but they go through your ledgers and they go oh wow john you paid all these people and uh, you pull up you 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 know you classify them as a subcontractor why and then you said oh well you know uh he doesn't really want me to withhold taxes so i have to pay him 1099 and that's why not a good reason and don't even try that and then you may say well yeah and uh, this person and he is um He's a cleaning guy. So, you know, the cleaning guys, they're different from my cooks and the waiter, which is so he's a subcontractor. Um, you know what? That's a very good reason to put that cleaning person as your subcontractor, pay 1099. It's actually a pretty good reason. However, because of the way you pay this person, IRS could disagree with you. IRS will say, no, he's your employee. He comes regularly. And how do you pay him? Oh, I pay him by, by hour. There you go. And they're your employee. Okay. So there is a place where they can argue those relationships. So IRS charge you and then they will say that, you know what, I am going to refer you to Department of Labor because I don't think you're using your employee properly. There might be a overtime uh, pay you didn't pay them. That's why your payroll cost is lower than what we expected. And there comes Department of Labor. And they will look at classification as well and they will argue and your cleaning guy should be employee and he worked overtime you you owe that 0.5 overtime payroll and then they go back for five years then you ended up with a half a million dollar uh, back wages that you're supposed to pay to these subcontractors who you are were paying 1099 okay so these are uh government compliance coming in from a angle to prevent employer or business owners to take advantage of people who might should be paid number one with employee benefit number two with overtime okay then what is the state workforce development here is for state workforce development is the same it's the same way in terms of your worker and your relationship. The employer and the employee or the employer 
and the subcontractor. So workforce want to make sure that you are not treating anybody who should be employee be the subcontractor because from the government, from the state government standpoint, they would not get uh, unemployment insurance if everybody is uh, subcontractors, right? Because they are collecting those unemployment insurance. So if the worker laid off and they will pay and they will pay percentage of wages for uh, a period of time. So those are the benefit. So keep in mind the government compliance coming from the angle that they want to make sure that you are not misclassify your worker to be a subcontractor. And it does the other way around happens? Do they come to see your employee goes, oh, that employee looks like a subcontractor? Never. Never in my 25 years practice, never in my 25 years research, I had come across a case where they're trying to remove your employee status, putting you into a subcontractor status. So it is always the other way around. Now, from the last standpoint, we are talking about subcontractor versus employee. That is from business sector standpoint, because business uh, has a model. Every business has a model. For example, if you are a restaurant, uh, how far apart you can be from the other restaurant. You have a model, you have chef, you have waitress, and then you have uh, the office manager or the restaurant manager, you have the owner. So the model of hierarchy is already there. So in the retail world for a restaurant, and you should never have your chef be the subcontractor. And are you going to make your cleaning person subcontractor? And the one thing I would give you a tip here that may help you to move them to subcontractor properly, which is to have your cleaning person form their own company, have your cleaning person and have their own insurance and charge you by jobs. If they can do that and you legitimately and writing a check to the cleaning company, one, two, three, and payment. So when IRS walks into your office, start looking at your checkbooks and the ledgers and they will not find John Smith's name on there. Because as soon as a person's name is on there, it looks suspicious, okay? So that's, the, that's where we say the business sector already said that the chef is not a subcontractor and you uh, should not have subcontractors working on jobs that a employee should do, okay? And what about retail of merchandise retailer? For example, um, you know, Home Depot, Menard, those kind of merchandise retailer. And the people who are running on the floor, and when you have questions, they come to answer your question, they cannot be subcontractor. They are employees. But the Menard also, when you, when you buy lumbers, and they have a list of people that you can call, so these people can help you work you know, put your numbers into certain ways so to get your work done. And you get those resources from Menard and those list of people, they are not their employees, they are the subcontractors. But they may not be subcontractors from Menard because they have their own um, business identity. So you can write check directly to those subcontractors, but it is also okay if Menard just have you pay to them and they then pass that money to the subcontractor because those subcontractor would have a YAYA number, business name, and they would have their insurance. I am pretty sure Menard would already vet it through those uh, credentials to make sure they're covered, they're covered, and they're covered, okay? So those are the things uh, the retail merchandise uh, would do. And then what about personal service kind of retail, like hair salon, nail salon. What about, um, you know, what about CPA firms? 
What about law firms? No, those are also those are kind of uh, in the personal service side. When you do that, and I, I should exclude CPA firm, law firm, I'm going to put them on the professional service. But on the personal side of service, nail salon and hair salon would be a good example. And those ones in practice, in practice, and a, a most of the state classify them, the, the, the people who work in the salon, classify them as a subcontractors. But they have a certain uh, credentials to measure that. So number one, let me give you those credentials. Number one, and they must be having their own insurance. So that would a signature of they are a separate entity, they are subcontractors. Number two, they're paid by jobs. Number three, they rent things from you. Let's say if I operate a big nail salon and I got all my furnitures in, 20, 20 stations, and so people can, subcontractors can come in, rent my table and work there for a day, okay? Rent my table, my table rent, is 60% of whatever you made that day. You make a dollar, give me 60 cents. So those are typical, typical subcontractor relationship. But do you have that in writing? Do you have them to sign? Did you explain to them that they're not your employee, they're your subcontractors? And so when you write that check and they don't consider that's their salary. So later on when COVID hit, they go to apply unemployment insurance under an employee of you. So those are mistakes happen a million times in the system, in the government system, because people are confused. They don't know what they are and you need to educate them. So those kind of services, yes, you can treat them. You can have subcontractors, but you must have these information, these contract, those credential uh, met in order to move them to a uh, to be a subcontractor. But of course, in that nail salon example I give you, and somebody has to be an employee. You cannot be, subcontractor all over. So there must be an office manager are paid by salary or paid by wages, whatever, however you want to pay them so they can manage that, right? So those are the, the model, the business model for retailer of personal services. Then what about a CPA firm? And a CPA firm, professional service firm, and everything we do has a risk, right? So you know, you may, be, you may be a lawyer and you have two, three other lawyers to work together and you formed this partnership, you know, five lawyers under one roof and call that ABCDE law firm. And that law firm itself, because you are all owners of the company, so you, you don't treat yourself as a subcontractor, but any other lawyers you hire, and if you want to treat them as your subcontractor, and you must have that subcontractor relationship, so they are getting jobs from you, and they go out to work their comp they work there under their name. If you want to use ABCDE as your law firm name, that just means that this whole law firm need to have a one professional service and the lawyers underneath this firm, because it's covered under that insurance, it will be employee of your company. So, you know, typically in a CPA firm, no one is subcontractor. Everyone is bounded by the same professional standards that uh, developed by the firm, they are all insured by the firm, and everything is um, unified. So there is no individual risk. Even if you made a mistake, even if you made a mistake and you left the firm, you're no longer working in the firm, but you made a mistake when you were there, that liability stays with the firm, not you. So that is why the, the professional employees are employees, they're not subcontractor. You can imagine how important that is. Otherwise, your subcontractors, you left the firm and later on something went wrong, it chased you all the way home, right? So professional service. Then construction is a big area where you could say that yes, it's employee, yes, can be a subcontractor, it's sort of 
more flexible. It is not more flexible. It is the owner's decision to make sure that you know who's your employee and you know who's your subcontractor. So if I am a owner of a contract, a construction company, I will make my employee responsible for things, whether it is make money or not, whether it is accountable or not, and only give the job that's so clearly defined to the subcontractor. And I only gonna have subcontractors who has their own LLC, who has their own incorporation, who has their own legal entity. And I do not want to myself to ever write a check to Yingsa, no. You want yourself to write a check to Yin's Corporation, Yin's Construction LLC. And to do that, that kind of lead us into the best practice. So with COVID, many, many things are changing because when COVID hit us in March, and I know you know that some of the subcontractors and the kind of regret, oh, why am I a subcontractor? I cannot get anything. If I am an employee, I can get UI, I can get all kind of benefit. And even for business owners, if we had employee, we can have PPP, we can have EIDL loan, and where the grant part come in, remember $1,000 for each employee. So as an employer, as a business owner, and we, we kind of see that those people who hired only subcontractors, too bad, so sad, they cannot have PPP. But the one with employee, they get into those kind of benefit. And the subcontractors later on, when the COVID got worse, uh, Congress start realizing that is a much bigger problem than what they think is gonna finish in one day, or maybe you, you drink some sanitation fluid, it will be cured. It's not like that. So suddenly um, they, they developed more things for subcontractors, right? So later on, subcontractor went on to website and start applying for unemployment benefit and they were uh, available as well. So those subcontractors, some of them, some of them were so confused when they apply for their benefit, they wrote into as an employee. They did not understand that then the, they themselves is the business. So the best practice out of the, out of the turmoil we have with this COVID-19, the best practice is that one, you, when you hire a subcontractors, you want to develop this document to make sure that they understand they are subcontractors. They're measured by result. They're measured by, by quantity of work they did and just really not measured by time because we don't care how much time they spend. We just care about the result, right? And you also want, this is the best practice advice I give you. You want every of your subcontractors to have a LLC. I don't even care whether the LLC's name is Yingsa LLC. That is fine. Yingsa LLC is not Yingsa. Okay. I have my own social security number, but my Yingsa LLC has its own EIN number. That is all what I care. I want that identity because when you write me a check, you no longer say Yingsa. You write Yingsa LLC. It is good for me because it is my business income. So I can qualify because I pay myself a salary. So my draw is my salary. So I can go for PPP loan application myself because I am a business myself. It is good for you because on your ledger, you no longer have someone's name on there looks like employee. You have a company name on your ledger. And when DOL or IRS or state workforce come around to look at your checkbook, they're not going to look at Yingsa's name goes, she should be your employee because they realize it's a company's name. If it is a company's name, obviously, it is not a body who works here. It is a company works here. Right. So that is the best practice we gave you. And so it, it mentioned that on my slide, I mentioned that, you know, 
you you want to help them to set up a company or LLC so you can write a check to the company and LLC, not just to that person's name. And with that, that kind of give you, um, give you the senses of what is all included in your consideration of subcontractors or employee. 